Hey everyone, Tsunari Red here. This video is about this four string bass right here, the Dingwall Combustion NG2. I've been extremely fortunate to have access to this bass and I'm gonna cover numerous aspects about it. First impressions, things I like, things I don't like, and especially how I feel about this multi-scale fan fret neck. There's so much I have to say, but I know most of you just wanted to hear what this bass sounds like, so we'll dive right into that.
Okay, talk time. So as all of you know, multi-scale or fan frets have become a thing in recent years in the guitar world. It's an emerging trend but it's still not mainstream enough to be a commercial thing so there aren't very many manufacturers who are doing this so the opportunity to try a multi-scale guitar or bass are a little hard to come by. And since I'm always keeping up with the latest in guitar gear and trends, I was naturally fascinated by this whole multi-scale thing so I was anxious to go out there and try. So many questions I had at first. What does it feel like? How does it play? Is multi-scale as beneficial as everyone says it is? Would I have to adjust my playing after years of firmly established muscle memory? Could this be the one thing that could help maximize my potential and take my playing to a whole other level? When it comes to multi-scale basses, right now there's no bigger name than Dingwall. They've established themselves as the go-to brand for multi-scale basses. Their basses look pretty sleek and badass, and they're based in my home country, Canada. So when I saw the opportunity to rent this from my local music store, I had to jump on it. Occasionally, I've tried a few dingwalls that I've seen on display, but it's one thing to try something for a few minutes in the store, and a whole other when you can play it for an extended period of time, try it in different situations, and become intimately familiar with it. Ultimately, my goal was to determine whether this bass and its multi-scale feature were right for me, and possibly acquiring someday. And whatever impressions and observations I have, hopefully can serve as additional information to you as well. So let's talk about the bass itself. This combustion is a four-string version, and most Stingwall basses take on this body design. And this one's in a Ferrari green color. You can check out most of the technical specs online, but I'll cover a few things that caught my attention. Overall, the build quality is really nice, really refined. You can tell they QA'd this instrument down to the finest details. The neck is really smooth, easy to play. Frets are nice, no rough spots anywhere. Hip shot tuners, very high quality. Individual bridge pieces, never seen these before, but they look pretty damn solid. Input jack feels a little weird when plugging and unplugging, but they specifically mentioned on their site that they made sure this would hold up well. The control scheme looks like a lot, but is actually straightforward. One volume, a four-way pickup position switch, and this switch activates an EQ system where you can boost or cut bass, mid, and treble frequencies. This four-way switch switches between bridge pickup only, both pickups in parallel, both pickups in series, and neck only. So what's the difference between both pickups in parallel or series? Well, I'm no electrician, but tone-wise, in series, the overall sound is louder and fuller. It's almost like a boost when compared to the parallel setting. It's very handy. So here it is in parallel. And here it is in series. As for the price, right now, where I live, Brand new, it is a whopping 2300 Canadian dollars. You can do the conversion for your country's currency, but either way, it's a lot of money. This price point is without question top tier, high end, boutique level. So what do I like about this space? Well, I've covered most of them already. The build quality, hardware, parts, the design, kind of futuristic and badass looking. The pickups sound nice and clean, no extraneous noise whatsoever. But I'd say my favorite thing is this EQ switch. This EQ is an absolute monster. I've owned bases where the EQ knobs make marginal changes to the sound, but these knobs, you can really hear the difference when you turn them. And keep in mind, what you're hearing is this plugged in direct. I've tested this through a number of amps and you can feel the difference. Now, what don't I like about this bass? Well, first off, these are strictly my opinions and I'll be the first to admit that I'm being really nitpicky over some of the things I'm going to point out. First, the pickups without the EQ can sound rather bland. In fact, when going direct, 
I'd say it sounds like crap. Granted, it sounds infinitely better when plugged in through an amp, and this EQ works wonders for the tone and can compensate for any shortcomings, but for such a high-end bass, you'd expect more for a default setting. Speaking of high-end, I'm also surprised that this neck is unfinished. No finish, no coating, nothing. It's all natural, edge to edge. Obviously, this is a personal preference thing. I'm fine playing this neck since it's so smooth and there are no rough spots anywhere, but it's a little surprising that for such an expensive bass, it's an unfinished neck. Other minor gripes, the pickup selector knob is counterintuitive. From my vantage point right now, when it's turned all the way to the left, you get the bridge pickup. When it's turned all the way to the right, you get the neck pickup. Like, really? Couldn't the knob just move in the same direction as the pickup you want to select, like on a Strat or Tele? The truss rod hole here can get in the way. It happened most often for me when I was popping with my finger ending up in this hole. A minor thing, but a bit of a distraction when playing. And lastly, this end of the bass with its funky design makes it a little iffy when putting on a guitar stand. I always need to make sure it's put in a way that it won't slip off the stand, but also in a way that it doesn't get in the way of the strap button, and especially the cable jack when it's plugged in. So let's talk about multi-scale now. Dingwall isn't the only company that makes fan fret bases, but they are the most prominent. One thing I've noticed with other companies for their multi-scale models, they don't necessarily use the halfway point of the neck as the center of the fan. What I mean by that is, looking at the neck of this ding wall, the straight fret is here on the 8th, and the rest gradually become more diagonal towards the ends of the neck. So looking at this, it fans out from roughly the middle of the neck. Not all companies do this. This is especially true with guitar manufacturers. I've seen some where the straight fret is on the 12th fret or on the 5th fret, but Basically, I wanted to try one where it's fanned in the middle so I can get a more symmetrical, balanced experience, I guess you could say. Now all this being said, I'll admit, the only reason I'm reviewing this particular bass is because it was the only one available for rent in my store. But thankfully, it fits the bill in this regard. The very first time I tried a multi-scale instrument was in fact a Dingwall. Four strings, same model, but in a different color. To those who are new to the concept of fan frets and are seeing it for the first time, the two big questions are usually, does it feel different? Do I need to adjust my playing? I had those questions as well. For me, soon after I picked it up and started playing, it felt fairly seamless to me. I was able to play the way I normally do and I didn't feel like I had to make any adjustments to my playing. That seems to be the general consensus from other reviews I've come across, so while I can't speak for everyone, I'm fairly confident in saying that you shouldn't experience any adjustment or learning curve with these fan frets. Of course, that's my initial impression after playing it for the first few minutes. To really get the full experience, I decided to put it through its paces over an extended period of time. So I've been playing in a freeform jam band recently using this bass exclusively. This gives me the opportunity to not only immerse myself in becoming more familiar with this bass, but also playing various genres and applying all sorts of playing techniques. And after some time, I started noticing a few things that I had to pay a little more attention to. For me, the biggest challenge was doing... I call this the power chord shape. That is... the root, the fifth, and the octave. So a number of times I found these two fingers right on the fret, or sometimes not close enough to the fret, and I wasn't able to get a clean vibration from the strings because of that. This is especially true when I was playing the lower frets, especially the first one playing the low F. The gap between the first and the third fret is wider than on a standard scale, so I have to reach a little further to get to these notes here. It also doesn't help that I have small hands. Speaking of small hands, I'm also finding it a little more challenging when trying to do two-handed tapping. Not that I tap much to begin with, but I do find I have to pay a little more attention when I'm trying to do so, especially on my right hand on the higher frets. I can't do it cleanly, so I'm not even gonna attempt it. The fan frets are helpful when going from string to string, such as when playing a box scale. For example, here's an A minor natural scale.
When I go from string to string, to me at least, it feels a little more natural, almost like the frets are in the right place and my fingers just happen to land on them. So that's a plus. Although I'll admit, I still need to pay closer attention while playing higher up on the fretboard, like here when I'm playing solos or lead parts, as the fanning is more pronounced here. The other challenge I had was playing licks that involve sliding down the fretboard, plus playing on different strings, especially when not looking at the fingerboard. Here's one riff, for example. What makes it challenging playing a riff like this, for me at least, is when you slide, the placement of your hand and the distance between the notes you're playing will feel different between the strings because of the distance between the frets. It's just something to pay attention to as you can't always be looking at your instrument when you're playing. One of the key things I observed when playing this revolves around the positioning of my left hand. Typically when I play bass, four string bass, my left hand is usually resting like this with the thumb wrapped around the top here. Next on a four string bass are usually narrow enough here at the top that you can get away with this. And at times I've used my left thumb here to play bottom string notes. But for these lower frets here, close to the nut, it's much harder to play like this since the frets are wider. Now this is just me, but my belief is that this whole fan fret thing is most beneficial when you hold the instrument properly, as in the way most instruction books tell you. The way classical guitarists position their fretting hand, like this, with the thumb more behind the neck. And when you do it this way and move your hand up and down the neck, you kind of realize that your fingers also move in the same arc as the fans. So the frets are actually better positioned where your hand stops, so it's more efficient. That's the benefit. The problem is though, most four string bassists, and guitar players especially, hold the instrument with the thumb sticking out at the top. This is especially true when playing standing up, and if you extend the length of your strap really low, with the top of the guitar bass resting at your waist, there's no way you can properly position your thumb behind the neck. So my theory is, to get the most benefit out of fan frets, you should hold the instrument higher up in order to hold it in this manner. But also, when you think about it, for instruments with huge, wide necks, you need to hold them higher up in order to even play them properly. That's probably why you see fan frets more common with guitars and basses with extended range, such as 5 and 6 string basses and 7, 8, 9 string guitars. And it just so happens that I was able to put my theory to the test. One day, when I dropped by my local music store again, there happened to be a number of ding walls, including a six stringer. This one, right here. I gave it a try, and naturally, with the neck being so wide, I had to hold it properly, with my thumb more behind the neck. The fan frets felt natural to me, and again, I didn't feel like I had to play any different from what I'm used to. It was comfortable to play for the most part, and I didn't really need to focus and look at the fretboard while I played. On a side note, for what it's worth, I also tried a different four string ding wall while I was there. This one, right here, a D-Rock. The body is similar to a Gibson Thunderbird, and most notably, it has 20 frets instead of 24. And while the frets are also fanned, I didn't notice the multi-scale as much. It almost felt like playing a regular scale bass. I'm guessing it's because of the fewer frets. Okay, so ever since getting my hands on this bass, I've been playing it exclusively. I haven't touched a regular scale bass, or even a guitar for over a month. I've pretty much acclimated going from a regular scale bass to a multi-scale, and my transition is what I've been talking all about up to this point. The last thing I want to find out is basically the opposite. What is it going to feel like going back to a regular scale bass? Am I going to notice a difference? Will I need to adjust in any way again? Well, I have to return this bass in a few days, so after I do so, I'm going to go right back to playing my usual bass and see how I feel. And I'm going to play for some time, like maybe a few days or even a week. It's most likely that I'll notice the biggest differences within the first few minutes of playing, but like before, I think it's best to immerse myself in the instrument to really be sure of my observations, so I'll check back with you after some time. Okay, I'm back. It's been about just over a week now. 
I actually returned the Dingwall bass the very next day and started playing my usual bass game right here. It's regular scale bass, as you can see here with the straight frets. Typical bass, aside from my choice of strings. So, how did I feel going back to my regular bass? Well, right off the bat, the first thing that stood out to me was how much easier it was to do my aforementioned power chord shape. When I play the higher three strings, I'm able to play the first two simply by barring my pinky. I realized I wasn't able to do this on the ding wall. For the lower three strings, it was also easier. When playing the second and third strings, I play in a lazy way where I simply press the two strings with my third and fourth fingers. I was doing this on the ding wall as well, but I find it easier to do this on my regular bass. Also, when I extend my strap lower, I'm also able to incorporate my thumb on the lower fourth string, especially on the lower frets. As mentioned before, I had trouble doing this on the ding wall. Playing on the ends of the fretboard were easier for me, especially on the higher frets. I would say this is more due to my familiarity with a regular scale as opposed to the fan frets being a disadvantage or a flaw. This is purely personal preference as I find my fingers don't need to shift around sideways as much going from string to string. I did find it easier to slap and pop on my regular bass here. Generally speaking, you want to get close to the end of the neck when doing so. But on the ding wall, it was shaped diagonally, so there was more wood protruding with the bottom string, which created some added distance for my popping finger. This isn't an issue on a regular scale, where it's straight. And finally, when I tried two-handed tapping, it was easier, especially for my right hand. You really want to hear me try? So overall, it was a slight transition going back to the regular scale, but I got back to being used to it very, very quickly. All the little challenges I encountered previously were gone, and everything just felt familiar again. Almost like returning home after a long vacation, if you can relate to that same feeling. Alright, so it's time to finally draw some conclusions. First, what do I think about this Dingwall bass overall? Well, it's definitely a high quality, top tier bass. I personally still find the price questionable given the unfinished neck and maybe, just maybe, it could be one of those cases where it's more about paying for the brand name as opposed to the instrument itself. There are some companies that are well known for being like this. I won't mention any names, but I'm sure you can think of a few. Either way, this is such a well-crafted bass, you can't go wrong. What do I think of the multi-scale on this bass? It's a very cool concept for sure. It took a little bit of getting used to, but there wasn't that much of a learning curve or a drastic need to adjust my playing. There were advantages and disadvantages to it, so is multi-scale bass for me? Well, I'm not going to say it's not for me, but if I had to pick between the two, I'll most likely opt for a regular scale bass, only because I'm more familiar with it after so many years of playing. Would I buy this bass? Probably not at full price. Even if I saw a deal on the secondhand market, I'd have to give it some thought. And finally, the two biggest questions that you probably have. Should you get this bass? And is multi-scale for you? The answer? You gotta try for yourself. It's the only way you'll know. Everybody experiences things differently, and everyone will have their own opinions on the same piece of gear. So if there's an opportunity for you to try a Dingwall or any multi-scale bass, go for it. Whether it's at your local music store, or from someone you know, whatever. Give it a try and find out for yourself. But I hope that whatever observations I've made in this video can serve as insight to you in helping you decide. And that pretty much wraps it up for me. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you stuck around for the entire video. Comments and questions are certainly welcome. Really appreciate it if you could give this video a thumbs up, and by all means, please feel free to subscribe. This is Tsunami Red, signing off.